Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special program. As you know, mayors in our community often are out there talking about the state of their city. Well, while Mayor Doyle from Beaverton is out talking in different venues, we were lucky enough to get Holly Thompson from the mayor's office to be able to present on the wonderful topic, what's really going on in Beaverton? Okay, I actually listed it as what's going on in Beaverton, but now that she's here to make it a little tougher, let's go with what's really going on in Beaverton. Ladies and gentlemen, Holly Thompson. Thanks, Rob. And you know what, now I'm gonna get rid of the speech and tell you what's really going on. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, I know Mayor Denny Doyle would love to be here, but he's actually in Washington, D.C. right now, participating in the National League of Cities Conference. And our Chief Administrative Officer, Randy Ely, is at another meeting covering for our mayor. So um, you're stuck with me. I'm a 16-year veteran of the mayor's office. I've worked for Beaverton that entire time. I lead our public involvement and communications division. I'm a lifelong public servant. I'll always work in public service. I believe in my core in public service, and so it's just a real privilege to serve the city of Beaverton and to be part of a fabulous agency. Today, I'll be sharing with you some of the mayor's priorities for the year, some of the accomplishments of what we've been able to achieve as a community this past year, and where we think we're headed. And I do want to emphasize um, how impactful having wonderful leadership is. You know, having the mayor off in D.C., that might feel really far away. But the reality of it is that the mayor is our chief lobbyist and chief proponent for Beaverton on a national stage. And since he's taken office in 2009, Beaverton has been awarded more than $24 million in grants to enhance our precious resources. And that doesn't happen by accident. It happens by actively engaging on a national and on a state stage to talk about our priorities and our needs. So we're very grateful at City Hall for all of his work. So the work that um, our division does, public involvement in communication, our main job is to help people find their voice in city government, to help make government transparent, accountable, and to make sure that we're always keeping up with all of the ways that people um, want to get information about this city and that we're being responsive. And that, in a nutshell, describes a variety of different activities within our division that encompasses media relations, government relations, our wonderful neighborhood program, which works with 11 neighborhood association committees, our boards and commissions, which have 16 active boards and commissions, mem uh, different boards with lots of different members on them. We also have our cultural inclusion program and our social media and video work um, within, our, within our division. So there's a lot of activities going on there. Big picture. Today we'll be talking about what's happening in Beaverton and talking about Mayor Doyle's priorities for the city for the next year. But first, I want to start by acknowledging a change on our city council. Um, this January, we had a new member join our city councilor. Her name is Lacey Beatty, and she is the youngest city councilor that we have in collective memory. We are actually, our, our uh, city historian is going back to try to check the ages of councilors from years gone by outside of our uh, present memory, because at 30 years old, to everyone who's been around a long time, collective memory, we believe Lacey is our youngest member. She brings a fresh perspective to the council. It's kind of fun to watch her uh, rib the other counselors, and there's just a new dynamic to their uh, conversation. So it's going to be very exciting to see how her participation in the council um, changes things a bit. The mayor held his State of the City address in mid-January. It was our largest State of the City ever, so we're very proud of that. We had over 300 people attend, and the mayor laid out his top three priorities for Beaverton, which we'll talk about. The mayor's theme for the State of the City is the future is looking better than ever for Beaverton. And we think that's true. There's a lot of good things happening in the community right now, a lot to be proud of, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Our economy in Beaverton is stronger, jobs are growing, unemployment is down to 5.3%, where it was 5.9% a year ago, 
Development is picking up, and I'll talk about some of the big development projects that are going on right now and how they impact the community. And the private sector is expanding. This last year saw Nike's continued investment in Beaverton and Washington County. Nike is working on their $1 million new square foot of office space at their world headquarters campus. And all of this supports their $150 million expansion. Nike is Beaverton's largest private sector employer and has already added more than 2,000 jobs, far exceeding their earliest projections. So when they were originally talking about the um, uh, possible expansion of the campus, they projected right away 500 jobs, and they've already blown past that with 2,000 jobs. This is a regional win. It's a great example of how all of the different actors within Washington County and the state come together to benefit the community at large. And that's part of a theme for Mayor Doyle, and you'll see that when we talk about his priorities for the year, constantly reminding the staff and the community that we're not in it alone, that it takes partnerships, it takes collaboration, it takes an open door, an attitude and a willingness to work together. So the regional win for the Nike expansion um, was really led by a team of folks from the governor's office, the state of Oregon, Washington County, the city of Beaverton, Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District, PGE, Clean Water Services, and many more. Beaverton's future is bright in terms of development. 2014 saw the adoption of the community plan for South Cooper Mountain. This area will one day be home to nearly 9,000 people, and this year you will begin to see some physical developments east of 175th. In 2016, we expect the first of the residential units, and in 2017, the Beaverton School District projects it will be opening the doors of the new high school at 175th and Schultz Ferry Road. Downtown Beaverton is seeing some development and new housing starts in our old town south of Farmington. And I wanna stop for a minute and talk about how important those housing um, uh, new developments are. Because one of the things that we learn as we focus on downtown redevelopment is that housing and getting people living and active in your downtown is really a glue factor for getting that pop that you need in activity in your downtown. And this is some of the newest housing developments we've seen in years. In 2014, Beaverton joined with community partners for affordable housing and Roy Kim Development to create a combination $19.1 million workforce and affordable housing project at First and Lombard. And just down the street, Rembold Properties is also moving forward with a $21.5 million mixed-use development, which will include market-rate housing at First and Angel. 2014 saw the adoption of our community-driven Creekside District Master Plan. This will strive to connect the jobs-rich area of Washington County and Portland right here in the heart of downtown Beaverton. And for those of you that might not be familiar with the Creekside District, what's really cool about it is that Beaverton has a unique opportunity. There are three different creeks that come together and, and coalesce together in our downtown. And years ago, as our downtown was developing, the creeks were covered. And what we're finding is there's such a beautiful natural amenity and an opportunity to daylight those creeks and bring back some of the inherent beauty and nature of the area and look at the thought of having development and opportunity blossom around our natural assets that are already here. It's an idea I see head nodding. And then thumbs up, yay. Um, it, it's a really, really beautiful idea and there's a lot of energy around that. So we're really looking forward to, the, to what happens with this with this project. Staff are in the midst of releasing a request for qualified developers this month to help imagine what the city and the metro owned property at the former Westgate Theater site could be. This is the parcel that's adjacent to the new Beaverton building at the, at the round. For those of you uh, that were here to see Janie Scott a couple of weeks back, you heard about the aspirations for an arts and culture center on this site. This certainly has a lot of buzz and a lot of support, and we have a very strong arts community that's doing everything they can to make this a reality. So we're looking forward to see what this process unfolds. 
In 2014, City Hall found a new home in the Beaverton Building. Buying the Beaverton Building cost the city $8.65 million, and in 2014, we completed renovations and moved into the building on time and within our budget. And I have to tell you that from the first few days just being in the Beaverton building, it felt like home. It was amazing how settled we were. Services, the, the staff had until noon um, the day we moved in to be up and running. Most departments were up within an hour or two. People were that dialed in and had done such a good job with the packing and the moving. It really was a seamless transition. The building, the Beaverton building is five stories. The city occupies the first, the fourth, and the fifth floors. The second and the third floors are leased to private tenants. And six, since the city took possession of the building, the building has gone from 40% occupied on the second and the third floor to 100% occupied. And what that tells us is the city's presence and oversight of the Beaverton building has made a tremendous difference in the private community um, investing in the Beaverton building as an option in a home, and it's becoming more and more vibrant. Today, the building is producing roughly $900,000 per year in tenant revenue, and that rental income is helping pay for the cost of operating the building. Another important project moving forward is the $22 million Timberland Senior Living Facility being developed by Renbold Companies located off Barnes Road. It could open as early as the end of this year or into the next. They're in the bubble period of figuring that out. The Timberland Senior Living Facility will be a mix of memory care units, assisted living units, and independent apartments. This nearly 165,000 square foot facility will be located on approximately three acres near Graymore's new $30 million Timberland Town Center. And I wanna pause for a moment to just acknowledge how important it is and how wonderful it is that Beaverton is ahead of the curve and continuing to think about how, finding opportunities for folks to age with grace in our city, to have a place to land. And as we look at the demographics, um, this is an important thing that cities need to be thinking about and fostering and supporting. Villa Sport was another win for 2014. This 130,000 square foot resort-like campus is first rate and employs 278 staff members. Infrastructure development is hot in Beaverton right now. And you know that's not exactly the sexiest phrase in the world, infrastructure development, but I actually think this next project's pretty darn cool. Um, in in mid-February, the city of Beaverton switched from our main water line to aquifer storage and recovery, ASR systems, for three to four weeks. We're in the midst of that right now. And the fact that this transition was so seamless and the fact that most people didn't, weren't even aware that it was happening speaks to the wonderfulness of the planning and the uh, professional planning that went into this project. And it's a really big deal. We're very fortunate in Beaverton that we have our uh, ASR systems. Those are underground water storage facilities and we use them during the summer. So as our peak loads go up, um, we're able to, dwell, to uh, use water that we've stored underground to help with our water distribution. But right now, we are in the midst of moving our main water line. And this is happening to accommodate uh, the Cornelius Pass Road expansion. So the city's main water line was right in the midst of where the Cornelius Pass Road expansion is happening and had to be relocated to 209th and TV Highway. And because we had the ASR system in place, we were able, and we're right now pulling about five million gallons of water um, a day from our ASRs. Our typical use right now will be about six to seven million gallons of water. So five million is coming from our ASR system. And we're uh, partnering with TVWD to, to do the gap of what we need between those two. So this project has been um, very well orchestrated, very well run. And pretty soon we'll have our main water line back up and be replenishing the stores and our ASRs. The future is looking brighter for our well-loved Beaverton libraries. Our main library is still the number one circulating facility in the state. Each year, our two libraries welcome nearly one million visitors. 
Daily, that equates to about 3,000 visitors a day who check out 10,000 items daily. And we just reopened the branch library at Murray Shoals. We added about 4,700 square feet and expanded the facility by 67%. This expansion gives a dedicated space for children's learning. We'll have additional story times, family events, more computers for kids, and space for teens. And I've already been over there with my family, and I can tell you it is already being well utilized, and it's really cool to see the children's expansion life. So if you can make it over there, I, I highly encourage it. This year, we're also focused on the WCCLS Library Levy in November. It's passage, this is the Washington County Coordinated Library System Library Levy. It comes up every so often. This year, in addition to a renewal, they'll be asking for a slight increase as well. I think it's about 22 cents. And its passage is essential to maintaining our current level of services. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that as November rolls closer. Beaverton's future is bright in terms of how our residents feel about our city. We did a, a community-wide survey last year, and an astounding 75% of our residents said that Beaverton was headed in the right direction. So three out of four of our residents said, we're, we're doing okay, we're on the right track, things are going well. Now, that sounds pretty good, but when you put that in context, our firm that helped us with it, DHM, said this was the highest such rating that they have measured in the past two years for any city or county. And typically, for a city like Beaverton, you would expect to be somewhere in the 50s to the mid-60s percentage. So to have three out of four to have such strong confidence in the direction of the city, we're pretty darn um, pleased with those results and, and humbled. And we'll talk a little bit about why we think we were blessed to get those numbers. 95% of our residents would, would recommend their neighborhood to someone looking to move, which is a high confidence vote, right? If you're willing to say, yeah, come join my neighborhood. Beaverton remains a very safe city. In fact, this year, we were recognized again as the safest city in the Pacific Northwest. And our community survey that I was just talking about revealed that 94% of our residents are satisfied with police services. Our municipal court was honored in 2014 with the League of Oregon Cities Award for Excellence. The court's innovative Be Sober program was recognized for its hands-on ability to change the lives and behaviors of chronic drunk drivers. This is a very special program and very unique. Uh, we're the only ones in the state operating this program, and it's a pilot, and we're hoping that other um, communities consider replicating it. The Department of uh, ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation, has given us grant money and is looking at our judges and our police staff and prosecutors involved to go around the state and talk about it. And what the program does is it focuses on people who have chronic substance abuse issues and are getting behind the wheel, and it really gets um, deep and personal and offers intense supervision and oversight and it's not meant to be a program that punishes the individual act of that violation but a program really oriented on getting to the root cause of their behaviors and changing their behaviors so it's a very very um, different program. And uh, some of the most meaningful testimony I've personally witnessed at council in the last year has been around this program. We have uh, one of our prosecutors who's worked for the city for 25 years. He got choked up. He said in his career working at the city, this was the most meaningful thing he'd ever been a part of. And he could really see the difference it was making in these chronic offenders' lives. It was very cool. And they're intense. I mean, the police will come right to your door, knock on your door if you're in the program, and say, you know, look, can we come in your house? What's going on in there? So the, the, the participants really sign up for a high level of support and scrutiny. So in terms of, oh, I forgot to talk about our community emergency response teams. These are our CERT volunteers. Um, which train people to serve in times of crisis. They achieved a big milestone this year, training their 1,000th volunteer. So it's a big milestone for that program in about 10 years. In terms of public safety, finding a permanent solution for our public safety center still needs to be addressed. 
So this past November, our voters spoke, and they were very clear, um, and they chose not to support a bond measure to fund a uh, remodeled public safety center. We know that people are feeling the burdens of heavy tax bills, and we know that we'll have to regroup and figure out next steps. So the chief and his team are looking at it, and they're talking with the members of the Public Safety Center Advisory Committee. Um, I don't have any new answers today except to say that they're, they're going back to the drawing board and trying to figure some things out. And one of the challenges there is the chicken or the egg. We're lucky enough that we have the Griffith Drive building that the police and court are currently in, but you don't want to spend too much money um, doing things to that building when ultimately it doesn't meet your needs. So they're kind of in a try to use good judgment, wait and see pattern. And one of the little known tidbits, I think, is that the majority of the police services are actually off-site from that building. The types of services that are off-site are property and evidence, um, and police training, which require different spatial design and use than the office building that the Griffith Drive building is. So there's some things there to figure out. Our future is bright because the people we serve are so actively involved in planning this city's future. So when I said earlier that we were um, humbled by our survey results and we thought that we knew maybe a, had a hint as to why they were the way they were, it's really because of this. It's because the city has developed a reputation of listening to residents, being responsive to community priorities, paying attention, and steering the ship that way. Beaverton's award-winning community vision program ad outdid itself in 2014. The volunteers on the Visioning Advisory Committee smashed their own record by connecting with more than 5,700 people to gather community input. In 2015, so this year, this group will deliver their five-year update to the community vision plan, ensuring that we reflect current needs. This past year, Beaverton made huge strides in supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Many people continue to be surprised by Beaverton's demographics. We have nearly 100 languages spoken in our school system. One in four people living in Beaverton were born outside of the United States. One in four. One in three people who living in Beaverton right now self-identify as a person of color in the census information. And 28% of the homes in Beaverton speak a language other than English in the home. Yeah, think about those statistics. So to effectively serve our community, the city must be fully capable of serving our diverse residents. And this certainly has an impact in how we deliver services and what those services would look like. In January, the City Council adopted Beaverton's first Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Plan. It was delivered by our one-year-old Diversity Advisory Board. These are 13 amazing community members who really rolled up their sleeve and had a wonderful process to come up with the starting point of what we should be working on. And the region and the nation is noticing what Beaverton is up to, and we'll talk about that in a second. We continued our partnership with the Center for Intercultural Organizing and graduated 22 immigrant and refugee Beaverton community leaders from an intense leadership development program called BOLD. One third of our BOLD graduates are now serving on a city board or commission. Just one year later after participating in this program, they're actively involved in their community. We continue to our partnership with Portland Community College to support 100 first-generation immigrant and low-income Beaverton students to attend college. And 96% of our students have stayed in school. Without this vital program, kids with similar backgrounds averaged a 19% return rate. This January, the City Council greenlighted moving forward to adopt minority and women-owned emerging small business policy work and our city purchasing rules. We also partnered with the State of Oregon to host an all-day seminar to connect Beaverton's small business community with public contracting opportunities. The event was attended by 90 small business leaders and 70 government staffers from throughout the region. And that was the first one ever on the west side, so we were pretty darn proud of that. And I'm very excited 
to share with you, and this is the first time this is being publicly said, so you all are getting to hear something no one else knows yet, um, that we just, this morning, Mayor Doyle accepted an award from the National League of Cities for Beaverton's diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Yay! Yeah, just this morning, I got the photo. He looks really cute. Beaverton earned top honors, tying for first place in the nation in the 2015 City Cultural Diversity Award programs for cities in our population range, which is 25,000 to 100,000. And the work that we're doing is looked at as a national model. So it puts us on the stage to help share with other um, cities. And we get those calls all the time now. Tell us how we can do what you're doing and how we can replicate the programs you have going on. So it's a, it's really cool. We're very, very, very pleased with this. The National League of Cities stated about Beaverton's program, it is truly a shining example of diversity and total community collaboration and partnership, which I think really ties in to the mayor's priorities for the next year and to his brand of leadership and style. So to sum up from the mayor's state of the city, he would, if he were here, he would say again, Beaverton's future is looking very bright, and he would remind us that in the state of the city, he focused on three key priorities. The first is investing in Beaverton's open for business reputation, and as the mayor said during his address, our message is simple. We are a good partner. We want to work with you. We want to help you grow and expand your opportunities in Beaverton. The second priority he gave was the passage of the WCCLS library levy. It's very important to maintain our current library services. And finally, investing in Beaverton's reputation of community partnerships, which is really his legacy as mayor. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. You can hang out here. Thank you very much, Holly. I'm very, very pleased personally to hear about the award today. I did get that in an email, and I think what the mayor has done with diversity is really cool. I'm a little haunted by the concept that he looks cute in the picture, but I'll get over that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move to questions, and we have a questioner right now. Hey, um, Jim K. Four member. Um, you spoke about the Beaverton Round, or now it's called the Westgate Site Center. The concern is that the greatest non-city tenant of that is Suzanne Bonamucci, is, who is not private sector. And the, also the concern is that we've had several speakers in the recent past talking about the projects for the Westgate site. It was supposed to be a medical center or with the urban renewal um, election. They specifically said it was not going to be a community arts center because that would sabotage the urban renewal agency by taking it off the tax roll and have minimal employment. So with the urban renewal thing, isn't the best way to sabotage that would be to take the largest, most expensive building, take it off the tax roll and make it the city hall, and then take the most largest piece of vacant land and turn it into a community center with minimal employment and off the tax roll. So it seems like the community is paying for the park district, school district, and fire district and the city is just wasting the vacant land. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question, and I want to kind of unpack a couple of different things in there. First, the, um, we'll, we'll deal with um, the Beaverton building and kind of the lease structure, and then we'll talk about the former Westgate Theater site. The second and third floor are completely leased out. So they are 100% leased. They bring in $900,000 a year in revenue to the city. And uh, Congresswoman Bonamici does pay to lease that space. So there is um, lease revenue coming into the city for all of the second and the third floor. Uh, in terms of the Westgate proposal, what I would say is that this month, the city is issuing a request for qualified developers. Um, that's a government term. What it means is that we are signaling to the development community that we are ready to see your development suggestions for the Westgate site. I think one of the experiences that Beaverton learned the hard way back in the 90s, and I'm a 16-year I'm a veteran and joined in 98, so kind of at the tail end of that, 
Um, but one of the lessons we learned is that we as a city, as a municipal organization, we don't want to be overly prescriptive. We don't want to dictate what a developer can make possible on a piece of land. So there are a lot of interest groups out there. The arts community is well organized. They're very excited and passionate about seeing an arts and culture center. There are a number of sites that they're looking at, including the Westgate site, and they're hopeful that it might land there. There's been talk of a health clinic, and there's a coalition of different agencies that have come together to say it would be wonderful to have a health clinic, and maybe that piece of property would be a good place for that. None of that has been decided or determined. The request for qualifications process that we're about to embark on is really the moment when the development community gets to look at the Westgate property, the 3.94 acres, and say, understanding what you've been talking about, understanding that it's a catalytic, meaning that it's a site that's very active, a great location in your downtown, it could be a spark to make some changes, this is what our company, our development group would recommend that you put there. They may choose to include an idea of an arts and culture center, they may not. They may choose to include some of the other things that have been discussed. They may not. And one of the things that um, I think has become apparent is that the property is big enough to accommodate, to accommodate more than one use. So it is possible that you might have um, a private development and a public entity of some sort sharing a space, sharing the parking, and helping spark mutual um, attraction and vibrancy. So. I would say stay tuned. I hope that helps. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, a forum member. Thanks for coming in today for pinch hitting. You did a good job. Thank you. <clears throat> I live in Beaverton, and I'm a big fan of Beaverton. Um, I'm a member of the CERT teams. I'm oh, also yeah. a graduate of the police academy, you know, the Citizens Police Academy, and I'm a board member of our NAC. In fact, our NAC is having a meeting tonight for the first time up in the new city hall in room 390, on the, so they must be leasing out some space there for that. Anyway, my question doesn't really have to do with that stuff. It, I'm, I'm curious about the development that's going on out at Roy Rogers and Schultz Ferry. I live downstream of that, so to speak, and I've talked to a number of people, officials and politicians and stuff, about the traffic situation that will develop, which I'm sure it will, and nobody seems to have any answers. And I'm just wondering if you might have talked about it or heard anything about that. Yeah, I'm not intimately involved. I, 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 there's a lot of talk about the South Cooper Mountain development and as that grows the um, impact in the area. And, you know, it's not a project I'm intimately involved in, but I can tell you that the community plan was adopted this past year, that there are community um, groups that have been meeting, that have been talking about the traffic and transportation concerns, and it's an active discussion. So, I mean, I think the, the reality of it is there are a lot of people that are really concerned and watching and paying attention, and that the community will continue to be in heavily involved as the uh, infrastructure pieces unfold. Patrick Wheeler, farm member. You talked about the diversity in Beaverton. Does the police force Reflect. represent that diversity? No, not at this point, but the uh, each department is required to submit their goals for the year. And one of the uh, number one goal from our police department is to um, improve on uh, diverse hiring. And frankly, it's not just within the police department. I think the city organization as a whole um, needs to improve in this area. It's an active discussion. We've got a lot of ideas on the table. Uh, we're starting an internal equity team to give uh, advice and guidance in terms of hiring practices. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll confess I'm a little biased. I wrote my master's uh, capstone for school in this area and know that there's a lot of things organizationally that we could be doing a little different to improve, and that work is underway. Our numbers are up. They are. In the last year, they're up, but we can do better. Harry Bodine, for a member. Yeah. I just want to make sure I heard something correct that you said earlier regarding the library levy. The, the county's going to be asking for a five cent increase over the present rate, which I think, if my math is good, equates to about $12.50 a year more on your property tax bill. Yeah. I just, it's not a 22 cent increase. 22 will be the new rate. 
it's a nickel increase. Thank you for correcting me. That's, I think, could be important to some folks. Yes, thank I, you for the correction. On to the question. Uh, I heard yesterday or the day before that uh, the Corps of Engineers has issued another a change in their floodplain around Griffith Park. And it's two feet higher than it was, which would put it inside the building where the police department and the courts are. How's that going to, what's that going to do to the remodeling? Harry, your Oregonian days and your skills are still with you. That is very impressive. So, um, th yes, this is an added complication in our public safety center um, discussion. So, we, we went to the voters in November and we asked for a $35 million bond to remodel the Griffith Drive building to be a home for public safety center for police and courts. And um, it was built, the entire plan was uh, developed with the participation of our planning staff, with the participation of folks that are very familiar with the current FEMA maps, and there was discussions with that group. And um, most recently, those maps have changed. And we were not aware that that uh, change was likely to be what it is to be. It, all indicators were that it was gonna be what we thought it was back then, not what it is now. So I'm gonna be a little fuzzy on the specific numbers, but what it would mean is that what they were planning to pour for the uh, foundation of the building would now have to be increased. And I think the height increase would be about 16 inches, if I have that correct, so don't, Quote me on it 100%, but it's somewhere in that range. Um, and that impacts the design and the specifications of what was possible for that building. So it's an added wrinkle that the chief, the mayor, the Public Safety Center Advisory Committee are going to have to work through. Um, given this new information and given what it means to cost of construction, is this site viable? And I don't think we know the answer to that yet. John Blackman, forum member. Here's a hardball coming at you. Okay, I'm ready. Highways 8 and 10. Could we not follow the example of Hillsboro between Freeway 217 and Cedar Hills Boulevard and make them one-way streets? Yeah, the one way, do we or don't we? Um, this one has been discussed a lot of times and it always dies because it, for whatever reason, it's less popular than popular. So it's been discussed many times and I'm not a transportation planner, so I, don't, I can't give you the ins and outs on it. Discussed by who? Besides the immediate stakeholders, is there any way to think about the people in the cars, many of whom actually yeah. live in Beaverton, but some of them do not? It I know it would take consultation with the state of Oregon, but still, why is it possible in Hillsboro and not in Beaverton? Yeah, I, well thank you. Um, that's one I'm gonna have to get back to you on an answer, and I know it was discussed by community folks. It came up uh, during the community visioning and was discussed in their kind of work team on transportation planning, but I'll commit to coming up with giving you an answer. Chris Leslie, four member. Under the uh, chart, I see the city council, the mayor, and then 18 departments, committees, or boards for various aspects of city government. How do you tie all those together? And isn't that an expensive proposition? I mean, you're hiring more people with all these boards and committees to do something, and that's taxpayers' money. So um, I think maybe we've got a little difference in understanding of Beaverton government structure. So Beaverton is a strong mayor form of government. Our mayor is our city manager, and we have a five-member council. Our councilors are uh, elected at large, so everyone votes for every council member. They're not like representing only a particular geography. And then there are eight departments. Our departments are the library, the mayor's office, public works, police department, human resources, finance, um, city attorney's office, and if I forgot one, I apologize. Um, community development, that was the last one I forgot. The boards and commissions that you're referring to 
are not paid positions. Those are all volunteers, completely made up of volunteer. The average board or commission, um, they range in membership from seven people, for example, on our social service funding committee, to 13 people is the norm on most committees. The largest, I think, is BCCI, which has a give or take about 25 folks. Every member of that is absolutely a volunteer, and it's part of our lifeblood. It's not about um, spending taxpayer dollars. It's about listening to taxpayers and making sure that the people who um, the city is here to serve have a voice and are actively involved in making policy recommendations in the areas in which they're most passionate about. So you have a couple of folks here that are involved in neighborhood association committees and that are part of the Beaverton Committee for Community Involvement. They are always working with uh, the city, watchdogging and paying attention to what we're doing from public involvement strategies, holding our feet to the fire, telling us how we could do a better job, how we can make information easier to get. So I think there's give or take of over 200 volunteers Again, not earning a dime, and who hold Beaverton accountable and make it a great place. Thank you. I'm sorry, you spoke about so many things, I have several questions. Okay, do um, best. An update on the Peter Court development and also on the food court yeah. idea. Um, also, um, I, you talked about groundwater, and there have been issues in the Midwest with groundwater and seismicity. Uh, yeah. Have you looked into that? So the quality of our ASR waters is top notch, and I can't give you like the, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a. No, it's not about the water yeah. quality. It's pulling water from uh, aquifers causes more earthquakes. Oh, I'm not aware of that. But we're not the five million gallons that we're pulling. They're more than able to withhold. So. I'm going to try to dumb this down to the way I understand it, because this isn't my area of expertise. But from what the guys tell us, there will be enough water to get us through the summer, and we won't even blink at what we're using now. So I will ask Dave Winship for information yeah, about that and get we back don't to need, you. Our earthquake situation doesn't no. need any help. No. <laughs> um, Bill, are you aware of the latest on food carts? Hearing that soon. Okay, so, yeah, Bill LaMarche is our public information manager, and what he was saying is that um, the planning commission is going to have a hearing on food carts coming up, and we'll get the date and get back to you. One of the barriers has been our code. Our code requires that they have to move and rotate, and that's not kind of the um, ethos of what's going on with food carts, right? They're kind of becoming little, little permanent stations. So we're working to make the code changes necessary to have the flourishing food cart activities and in the I city. I assume that you're working with some of the experts Assume that you're working with some of the experts over in Portland because they're yeah. doing it right. Our economic development group is, is working on it. Yeah. Great. And Peter Coyd? Um, besides the Timberland development, sort of looking at that schedule around there um, in late this year, early next year, I don't have any more. I can look into that and get back to you. Uh, she can look at that. Thank you. Look into that yeah. and get back to you. Huh. Okay. My other if question is a little more general. Um, since Mayor Doyle took office, yeah. most of us have noticed a sea change in Beaverton. There's so much more community focus. Um, it's a friendlier city. It, it's got a lot of admirable projects. I guess my problem is continuity. Um, who are we going to, when Mayor Doyle decides not to run again, how are we going to keep Beaverton on the right track? <laughs> You're going to hold all of your elected officials accountable. <laughs> Very good answer. One more question oh, coming yes. at you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I get to chair this, but I also get to ask questions. Rob Solomon, forum member. In that list of wonderful things, and there are, it is a good list, it's very, you have every right to be proud. And having worked with you a little bit, you have every right to own some of that as well. Holly, you made reference, just a brief reference, to the health center. Now that health center got federal bucks, good federal bucks, what, a year and a half ago? Yeah. 
and it had its big splash. Beaverton's going to do it, and boy, it's a great plan. I support it 2,000%. Would love to help it. Would I just think it's fantastic. It speaks well for Beaverton. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, you know, I'm learning a lot about development projects, right? There's always really great ideas, and our, our development manager talks about from the um, creation of an idea to the actual, you know, day of the ribbon cutting, there's a million possible pathways in between from what point A to point double Z. And what I will tell you is that the partners are still engaged, they're still meeting, they're talking, um, they're working on site locations, and whenever you're trying to figure that stuff out, it usually happens um, in closed doors. So I know that there are still active discussions happening among the partners. Are all the partners engaged? My understanding is that there's been some drop off. I, I can't give you that specific. Okay, and I'm not, okay. Yeah. Engaged but stuck? Yeah, I think they're trying to find the site that'll work. All right, thank you. John McWilliams, four member, and uh, thank you so much for being here. You're doing a terrific job. Oh, so um, I'm gonna These are tough questions. Wow. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, growing. And uh, it seems to me that Beaverton is really courting Cedar Mill and Bethany in that area. So um, I've been to a couple of meetings that um, where it's really pretty smooth. So I was just wondering, can you give any information on, on how that would affect Beaverton and, yeah. and uh, what the possibilities are? Well, first and foremost, on this topic, I always want to start with this sentence and let it hang. Beaverton has a policy of voluntary annexation only. Voluntary annexation only. And it's been interesting because um, some of the CPO leaders have been reaching out, CPO 7 in particular, and inviting Beaverton to come up and participate with the county in a um, education forum series to talk about what does city services in Beaverton look like compared to the urban unincorporated services provided by the county. Um, as staff, it's the kind of thing that makes me freak out because I think people in the room think, oh, big bad Beaverton is here to try to annex, and that is not what is going on. The city has been invited by a CPO to please come out and describe what you're up to. What services do you provide? What does that look like? There is no interest in trying to draw property into the city of Beaverton where owners do not wish to be here. Um, I don't have the members memorized in my head, but we have had several voluntary annexations that total millions of dollars in assessed value since 2009 when Mayor Doyle has taken over. Um, and that does help. In fact, one year he was able to lower the millage rate of the city based on the new property that has come in. But ultimately there is no policy of forced annexation and anybody who comes into Beaverton is going to come because they want to come. And what's the hook? Why do people want to come? I think that's an individual choice and one that's really going to be micro-based. No, no neighborhood issue is the same from neighborhood to neighborhood and block to block people are dealing with different things and so if people want to join the city of Beaverton it's going to have to make sense for Beaverton and it's going to have to make sense for uh, the community members living there and there's got to be an added benefit for all. Thank you so much Holly. A couple of things. You're right there are tough questions. It's one of the reasons I keep coming back the questions are absolutely amazing, and this direct contact that you were able to provide us with, through you with the city, is wonderful. Second, folks, I have had the pleasure in the past of working with both Bill LaMarche and with Holly Thompson, and one of the things as we talk about Beaverton's recognition with diversity, I just want to take half of a second to acknowledge that Holly Thompson has had an awful lot to do with that success. I was lucky enough to read her master's thesis, which was excellent and educational. And I, I know that when, when you work for the city, when you work for a big organization, it's kind of hard to find who's responsible for some really good things. Interestingly enough, we can often find who's responsible for some bad things. But I just want, didn't want the day to pass without acknowledging Holly's really fine work, and I'm very grateful for it. Thank you, Holly. And folks, one more time, don't forget to leave a tip. And next week at this very same place, very same spot 
At noon, we're going to hear from Cliff Goldman, who's a volunteer with HCAO. For those of you who don't know, that's Healthcare for All Oregonians, whose mission is to try and develop a single-payer system in this state that covers everybody. So whether you're in favor or not, it should be a very interesting um, presentation next week. Once again, thank you so much to Holly and the city of Beaverton. Thank you, folks.